Thousands of people have mysteriously vanished in America's wilderness. Join us as we dive into the deep end of the unexplainable and try to piece together what happened. You are listening to Locations Unknown. Hi, and welcome back to Locations Unknown, episode four. I am Joe. And I am Mike. And before we get going into the show, uh, we have a couple of housekeeping updates that Mike's going to take care of. Mike, take it away. Yeah, so a couple of listeners have asked if we accept donations, and at the moment we we don't because we don't have a platform to do it, but I will be posting our Patreon account onto our Facebook page, so if anyone wants to help the show out, Joe and I do this on a shoestring budget. We, we're not making money off this show we both have full-time jobs. We we just like talking about backcountry stuff and mysteries. Also going to be launching a Locations Unknown swag store on Facebook. Oh, yeah. We'll I'm be, excited about this. Yeah, we're going to be selling all kinds of cool stuff like hats I, and I mugs. I love hats. And, uh, stay tuned for that. And finally, this is really exciting. We're going to be holding a Locations Unknown brand ambassador competition in the coming months. I'm not going to release any more information on that. Uh, we'll post it on Facebook, but stay tuned. It's going to be really exciting. person who wins is going to win a lot of free swag and some cool stuff. So stay tuned. All right. So on June 15th, 2005, Michael Fissery, who was 51 at the time, an avid experienced hiker and backpacker, went to the north side of the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir in Yosemite National Park. He was going to do a solo hike, uh, just do a loop through that area. During that hike, he, he disappeared somewhere and he wasn't heard from again. It's a theme of our podcast. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, it's almost like his location's unknown. It's, it's so many people we never find. So we'll talk a little bit about Yosemite National Park. It's in the western Sierra Nevada portion of Central California, and it was established on October 1st in 1890. The size of it is 747,956 acres. So that's 1,168 square miles. And big park. it's a big park to, to give you an idea of its size. It's five times larger than the city of Chicago. So five cities of Chicago that are mountainous and wooded and dense brush. That's how big this park is. Have you actually been to Yosemite? I have not. I have not either. <laughs> I know, it's really sad. I know. Because it's, it's like beautiful and it's like super popular. And I we tend to go to like the more... I think we're me personally, I'm drawn to the less visited parks. Yeah, same here. Because I kind of like getting that solitude. Yep. Although, as I've been researching this, there's a ton of backcountry trails that are very, they say like the majority of the traffic is in a very small portion of the park. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to have to hit it up. Plus, it's pretty far away, and I typically prefer to drive to the parks. I'd have to fly here. And yeah. The, the no, stuff it's definitely on my list. I definitely want to eventually hit every national park in the country. But Yeah, this one should be soon. Yeah. We should go. We'll go. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. So as far as uh, we said, it's a very, very heavily visited park. They average 4 million people per year. What's crazier than that, three quarters of that happens in six months. Yeah. So the majority of the visitors come in half the year. So it's... It's, it's crowded. It's crowded in the touristy areas. But like I said, what I learned was there's a huge portion of the park that is pretty much not touched mm-hmm. at all. And that's like for your guys like Michael Fissery. Like he's going to go out and do this deep backcountry stuff. People who are doing the Pacific Crest Trail from top to bottom. That goes through there. Yosemite is, uh, here's just some fun facts about Yosemite. It's home to one of the tallest waterfalls in the world. It's Yosemite Falls at 2,425 feet. Wow. So I'm sure everyone's seen pictures. I, oh, if you own a Mac, El Captain is their update. So you've seen that that's at Yosemite. If you've ever seen a picture of a waterfall at Yosemite, it's definitely going to be that one. They have a lot of waterfalls, but that's one of the biggest ones in the world. Yeah, that's taller than the Sears Tower. Yes. Um, taller than the that tower out in Dubai. I mean, that's... It's big. That's <laughs> it's, a really tall waterfall. It's really big. Yeah. <laughs> so this one was really neat too. Did you know, Mike... That Yosemite is one of the few places in the U.S. you can see rainbows at night. I did not know that. That is, I didn't know what that was at first. But did you look into that? Because I'd like you to tell me. I <laughs> I'm going to. Um, so it's world, it's world famous for its waterfalls. We said it's got a big one. There's, there's lots of other waterfalls there. Basically, because of where it is and how big the the waterfalls are. Yeah. When you've got a full moon, they call them lunar rainbows or moon bows, which moon so, bows. Yeah, wow. moon, moon bows. <laughs> Sounds like an IPA, yeah. <laughs> like, like something something a hipster would drink. So in, in the spring and early summer, if the sky is clear and the moon is full, 
it can produce enough light to create a rainbow from the waterfall's mist. I just, I can't even fathom what that would, like, think about seeing a rainbow at night. Yeah. I, I don't know. Do you remember? I, I, just, do you remember brain, the, I can't wrap my brain around Do you remember it. the YouTube video, the double rainbow guy? <laughs> I'd like to see him do a video of seeing a rainbow at night. <laughs> that would be awesome. A night rainbow. <laughs> oh, man. But, yeah, so, I mean, I would go to try and see one of those, although usually... I get in the luck where it'd just be cloudy and rainy the whole time. Right. So uh, National Park Service said that Yosemite accounted for one quarter of all the SAR dollars spent in 2005. So this is getting into a little bit of search and rescue, but basically a quarter of the entire budget for search and rescue went into the National Park Service in 2005. Which, if anyone you know has followed the 411 books by David Paulides or follows missing persons, Yosemite is one of the parks where there are a ton of unsolved missing persons cases. Yeah, people get hurt there all the time. They go missing there all the time. There's a lot of search and rescue going on. I filed a Freedom of Information Act request with the Park Service uh, late last year, and I was able to actually get a list of, of, I believe it's people missing before 2000 in in the park, and it's 20, 30, 40 people long going back to 1900, so... I don't know if it has to do with the size of the park or the train of the park, but it just seems like a lot of people have gone missing in this Starting park. Starting to think extraterrestrial hotspot. Yeah, yeah maybe. <laughs> um, Bigfoot's lair. Yeah, that's, I don't that's, know. that's his home home yeah. base. <laughs> so, yeah, it's... it's it's um, So that's not surprising that they spend a lot of money on search and rescue in the park. Yeah, and, and just even when you think about the volume of people, too, you'd yep. expect it, I guess, is yeah. when you're cramming that many people in that short of a period of time. A couple other facts. Yosemite Park was the first area of land set aside by the U.S. government for preservation and protection. So that was kind of the kickoff to huh. national parks. Ironically, though, it wasn't the first national park. It was like the third. Yeah. But it, I think it's because it was like they didn't call them national parks. Yeah, it was exactly. like protected land back then. Yep. So another thing that Yosemite is famous for is the giant sequoia trees. They can live up to 3,000 years and are considered to be the largest living thing on the planet. I'd say with the exception of that like bog Oh, that's yeah. all like an interconnected living thing. Now, they say that is technically the largest. But the it's... sequoias are the ones that you, they have that road that goes through one. Yes. Right? Okay. Yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah. That's that's the one. And then um, I did read that was pretty cool. The seed for sequoia trees like super small. Really? <laughs> it's like a normal size seed. Yeah. Which is it's you'd think a seed would be like the size well, of a it's, car. You don't know, like <laughs> there's a lot of things like like moon bows and yeah. like that. Like you think about you're like that's pretty cool. Like it's. Something that's smaller than like your fingernail grows yeah. into, you know, a 3,000 year old living behemoth of a tree. Yeah. You Crazy. know, so it, it's nuts. One of the people directly attributed with, I, I would even say partly making the whole National Park Service thing work, you know, preserved areas was John Muir. And he was a writer, a naturalist, and a founder of the Sierra Club. I'm sure everyone's heard of the Sierra Club. There's John Muir trails everywhere. Mm-hmm. So he was taken with Yosemite. So he went to Yosemite. He was so taken with it that he headed up, he headed up the effort to preserve it. And the efforts led to that park establishment in 1890. And in 1903, President Theodore Roosevelt toured Yosemite with John. And in 1906, the park came under federal government's control. So that's why I'm so disappointed that I've never been there. I mean, you always hear how beautiful it is, but I mean, you have this guy here basically devoted his life to preservation after seeing it. Mm-hmm. Brought a president there, and after the president saw it, you have like the National Park Service. Yeah. So it's that beautiful. <laughs> like entire governments have been formed by the beauty of this park. It's obviously great. The pictures look awesome, but I think you and I know, Mike, pictures never do any of the things we see justice. No, ever. even even our even, own pictures, we look at them we're like, wow, yeah. it's way better than that. I've shown I, I've had stretches where I'm like, you know, while you're hiking, you're like scared you might fall over the side and then I, I look at the video footage later and i show people and i'm like oh that doesn't look bad like you, you can't tell yeah me. yeah like, you have to be there you have to be there <clears throat> all right so we'll get into the climate of yosemite because this will play into um just an idea of what um michael was potentially experiencing so it's got what's considered a mediterranean climate that means most of the precipitation falls during the during like a mild winter and other seasons are nearly dry so less than 3% of the precipitation falls during long, hot summer. So, I mean, it's it's usually not rainy there, which is also probably why it's really popular. At the park headquarters, the elevation is at 3,966 feet. 
January averages temperature is like 38.2 degrees. So it's it gets cold. Mm-hmm. It's it's not like it's warm all the time. It's just usually dry. Yeah. Uh, July te- average temperature 73. Doesn't get too hot. Through the summer, the nights are much cooler than the hot days. Average of 39.5 days with highs of 90. So you'll get over a month with like 90 degree temperatures. You're not yeah. getting like desert. Yeah, there's 97.9 nights that are below freezing. So that's three months that you'll, at nighttime, you'll have freezing temperatures. So that's yeah. that's an exposure concern. I wouldn't say heat's an exposure concern because it's so wooded. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot, a lot of, of cover. Yeah, a lot of shade, <laughs> a lot of cover. The freezing can be a big issue. Record high temperature was on July 20th at 1915 was 115 degrees. So oh. yeah, it was, you know, a century ago <laughs> yeah. that you had that temperature. So that just goes to show it doesn't get very hot there. Yep. That's a, there's a high temperature, but it was all the way back in 1915. Recorded low temperature was negative six, which it was negative 40 with wind chill here like two days ago. Yeah, like so that's the- like, that would have been fantastic. So yeah. it, the, the record low is in my opinion, not that bad. We're from Wisconsin, though. If you live in Southern California, that sounds awful. Yeah, the the high the other day here in Wisconsin, where I, where I live, was what minus twenty or yeah. minus fifteen. Yeah, that was without wind chill. Yeah. So as soon as you get a gust of wind, it's like you can't be outside more than three minutes. Average annual precipitation. So as we said, it's not raining a ton. Thirty seven inches falling on sixty five days of the year. So mm. you have a very rainy period followed up by just extreme dry the rest of the time. Uh, as far as animals go, black bear are and mountain lion are the top of the predator chain. Yep. You have mule deer, bighorn sheep, and then your average smaller rodent. And from what animals. I read, the the area that Michael was hiking in, lots of black bears. So I could imagine when you look at the map, it's very rugged and yep. not a lot of people are going there. It's it's a pretty it's a pretty gnarly loop that he did. And yeah. we'll have we'll have pictures on the site for that. The terrain. Very wooded, granite rock. Uh, if you ever look at the picture, like I said, El Captain. Yeah. If you if you don't even if you've never seen a picture, but great you've got, documentary coming out on that. Really? Oh, on the uh, the free climber. The free climber. Yeah, that guy's insane. Yeah. No thanks. <laughs> um, but if you like I said, if you have a Mac <clears throat> laptop, you've gotten your El Captain update and the picture of the mountain. <laughs> like that. That's it. That's yeah. that's it's so awesome looking. Apple made it their update name and made it the main wallpaper of their. their and thing. yeah, and. Uh, uh, Yosemite, the hiking there is it's alpine hiking. You've got your really peaceful meadows down in the, you know, the valleys. And then you've got your, your mountains that are yep. 11, 12,000 feet. Yeah. Most of the hiking though is below 10. Yeah. So, I mean, altitude shouldn't be much of an issue. Yeah. Lots um, of water, lots of water, lots of shelter, lots of people, Yep. um, over 800 miles of trails. So that's where you can kind of, that's where you're starting to see maybe where they're getting in that search and rescue a lot. That's a lot of hiking miles. Yeah. Most of it backcountry, as we said, where you need permits and stuff. Uh, so you get everything from easy strolls to challenging mountain hikes. Yep. Overnight backing trips. Uh, one of the most popular trails leads to the summit of the Half Dome and requires permits. So they like only allow 300 people a day to do it. And it's all lottery. So yeah. they said it's 225 hike- day hikers are allowed to go. That's people who go out and come back in the same day. And only 75 backpackers or overnight people mm-hmm. can go. So that's... They have that for day hikes. Yeah. That gives you an idea of how heavily trafficked this park is. Mm-hmm. I think this is the only park I've heard of so far. I'm sure there's other ones that has permits for day hikers. That's crazy. Usually I think where I've gone that's had day hike permits. Um, I mean, it's usually the campgrounds that you're going to yeah. stay at are permitted. Yeah. You could, if you can walk there and come back, you're more than happy to, but you can't camp there unless you have the yeah. permit. That was, that was that's glacier. usually how it is. Yeah. yeah. So difficulty in general, I would say... In the traffic areas, easy. And it's you, as difficult you, as you want it to be. Exactly. There's, it's not yeah. a set level. There's some parks where everything's either easy or slow. This one, you can get a little bit of everything. Yep. But the heavily trafficked areas, I'd say, are almost all easy. Yeah. All, all the touristy spots are all easy, and then you can get into your, your, your gnarly other areas. Yep. Real quick, I'll talk about the Pacific Crest Trail because that's popular. If anyone's seen the movie Wild, um, <laughs> that's this is the trail goes through Yosemite. This is kind of towards the north more north of the middle of the trail. Yep. Um, but that stretch is 2,650 miles from Mexico to Canada. So along the mountain crest trail of the Cascades of the Sierra Nevada through the Mojave Desert, it takes about five months if you if you through-hike the thing. And through-hiking yep. is start to finish, no breaks. And Yosemite contains about 70 miles of the PCT. So again, yeah. just roughly the size, 70 miles of that trail are just Yosemite National Park. 
So highest point of the PCT, 11,000 feet, not too bad. And that's at the Donahue Pass. That's at the park southern border. And the lowest spot is about 7,560 7, feet at Benson Lake. Yep. So average time to hike that is six to 10 days. That's just through the park. So I know a lot of people say, if you're a PCT through hiker, they try and do like 20 miles a day to mm-hmm. stay in a five month. So if you can imagine every day, yeah. 20 miles to stay within your five month window. So <clears throat> six to 10 and, days, that's like 10 miles a day. And depending on where you're, you're starting from on the trail, some of the people from what I've read, like to start in April and March even. And when you're starting that early, there's sections of not, this isn't in Yosemite. This is just the trail in general where you're going to need crampons and ice axes to get across sections of the trail. Depending on where you start, it can be a very strenuous trail. It can be dangerous. Yeah. You have to plan climate and season changes. There's climate and season changes. It goes through the Mojave desert. So you have water issues there. Yosemite uh, seems pretty, it's pretty strenuous, pretty strenuous. I think similar to some of the stuff we did in Glacier. And they said bears are a major concern. Bears are a major Granted, concern. Granted, it's not grizzly, but still, when you have a a large volume of a species, yeah, um, I still it's like be, economics. There's competition for food. I still don't want to be chased by a 400 pound black bear. Exactly. Know? Yeah. I mean, I mean, when you have there's a lot of <laughs> bears there, so you have a lot of food competition. So if you're yeah. in an area that's not heavily trafficked by people, solo hike with food on you, yeah. That's kind of like a target on your back. And it's funny you mentioned the movie Wild. A lot of people that like hiking the Pacific Crest Trail before that movie came out said it was a lot less crowded. And they hate that movie now because (laughs) so many people came to the trail after that that movie came out. And you're you're getting a lot. You now that the you know mainstream movie comes out, you're getting a lot of people that are less experienced at hiking, especially long distance you know backcountry hiking. I read a couple forums where people are complaining about pileups on the the trail and trash and so yeah, it's too bad. It's it's it's, and it's usually people who shouldn't be out there, like you yeah, said, exactly. less experience. They really shouldn't be doing it, but they're like, hey, the movie looked cool. Yeah, and they're like, oh wow, <laughs> hiking is hard. And yeah, like, yeah it's, it's a lot of work. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, that's that's the basic overview. Um, we threw in a little extra for the PCT because it is popular. So if we make it more popular, sorry. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's tied into this case a bit. From you'll I'll go through the the timeline in a bit, and you'll see see why we brought it up. Yeah. So I want to learn a little bit more about Michael. I didn't. Um, I tried to stay away from the timeline a little bit. So I'm hearing a lot of this for the first time, and I'm hoping. That way, me and Mike have different opinions of what occurred. It's kind of yeah. a new thing we're trying a little bit. So. Mike, tell us a little bit about Michael. I'll preface this with there is very little information on this man out on the (laughs) Internet. Being that he went missing in 2005, I was shocked when we couldn't find news articles on him or Facebook pages. Yeah, there wasn't. There was not a lot of information on him. Like not even like a local television report. Yeah. Which usually, I mean, that's a story like, oh, uh, you know, well-known hiker yep. or someone who experienced hiker goes missing here. Even if it's just like the family said this, they try and get in touch with the wife or yeah. whatever. There's nothing. So obviously his name was Michael Allen Fissery. He was a male. He was 51 at the time of his disappearance, born March 30th, 1954. Uh, he would be 64 years old now. He was your average male, uh, five foot 10, 165 pounds. He had a gray hair, gray beard, and a mustache. So would like an inch taller and 10 pounds heavier also still be average? Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking for a friend. Yeah. <laughs> Are you? <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, Go on. <laughs> so his, uh, his hair was shoulder length at the time of his disappearance. He was last seen in a faded blue or gray t-shirt with sleeves ripped off, olive green or khaki shorts, and a torn pink or red scarf. So he had gray hair, gray eyes. Gray eyes? Green eyes. He's a snow walker? He's a snow walker. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and he was wearing glasses at the time of his dis- disappearance. So he was, you know, you typical hiker. Yeah, we'll have the picture on the site. Yeah. You know, he's he's a stereotypical. There's only one picture we could find of him, really, too. Yeah, I yeah mean, the other ones, there's some of them that need a lot more pixels to yeah. even post because you can't even tell it's him, but... He's very stereotypical solo hiker. Yep. Californian. Yeah. Like it looks like he's like an age surfer that like gave up the sea a long time ago and now he's just focusing on the land. Yeah. Like <laughs> So um that is the description of Michael. We we scoured the internet and we could not find any more details on what he looked like. We even reached out to a couple of people to try to 
try to talk to people involved in the case, and we we never heard back from them. So yeah, we're we're not getting anywhere with this one. We're we normally get a lot of cooperation. So yeah, it's very that's odd. maybe there's a little conspiracy back yeah, on maybe. That. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna go into the detailed timeline a bit. Again, this timeline is very for being so recent. It's got a lot of barely any information. That's where I was trying to go with that. Yeah. So like Joe said, on June fifteenth of two thousand five. Michael visited the north side of Hetch Hetchy Reservoir in Yosemite National Park for a solo hike. His plan was to hike to Ranchera Falls, uh, Tiltill Mountain, Lake Vernon, and then through the Beehive before returning to Hetch Hetchy Reservoir. Now, reports say, and we've been trying to find out where these reports came from, uh, reports say that at some point during the day, he decided to begin walking north towards the Pacific Crest Trail. So in order to do that, he would have to walk basically around Tiltill Mountain, and there's a T in the trail that heads towards... He'll have to keep going north. He'd have to keep going north. Uh, probably like three or four miles to intersect with the PCT. Yeah. Now, this entire loop, like Joe said, the loop that he planned on doing was about 29 miles, I believe. 25.9. 25.9 yeah. miles. So, and he had about, he had a, he had four days until his permit ran out. So he, that's like, yeah, that's eight, that's eight miles a day. Yeah, if he's, tra if you're traveling light, you can do it's, that. It's mountainous. So you're going to go, I always try and break it down when you're hiking on flat ground, two to three miles an hour is what you're moving Yeah. when you're moving. So if you're going to take breaks, obviously that cuts away when you're in mountains, half a mile an hour. Yeah. You, maybe even slower if you're in a switchback that's steep. Yep. But that four days for a guy who knows what he's doing for that distance and he seemed to be familiar with the area. Yeah. From what I've heard is he's very familiar with the area, hikes, hikes there a lot. Before. So he knows what he's getting into as far yep. as terrain goes. So that, that's more than enough time for him. He can he can smell the roses while he's doing this thing. Yeah. So interesting note about Michael. In one of the articles we found, a family member mentioned that he was not reliant on technology. So uh, he would have gone out on this hike without a cell phone. He never owned a computer. So he was like a hippie. He's like your OG California hippie. Yeah. And even he kind of looks like that. Yeah. Even the family member, uh, this person claimed to be, I believe his brother claimed that the family member claimed that he didn't think he was prepared for this hike. And that's literally a good example of how little detail on this thing. Yeah. We aren't a hundred percent sure it is his brother that's We're not. saying this because so, the, even the report said someone claiming to be his brother. So it's like no one verified that. Yeah. But obviously they, they had enough detail on that they knew him well enough to at least give us this information. But that's yeah. how little details are on this case. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, June 19th of 2005, his family became concerned when he didn't return after his permit expired. On June 21st, the, the family informed the Park Service that he was missing and they started a major search and rescue operation. From what we could read, there was the rescue operation included personnel from five counties with aircraft and tracking dogs, which is your pretty, you know, in our last episode, we talked to Dave Haskin and he's out in Colorado. He's a director of search and rescue out there. I'm, I'm assuming this type of operation would be similar to something Dave mentioned that his team would go on. Yeah. So you're talking a big team of people on the ground, dogs. And it's 2005. So it's 2005, more modern technology. Helicopters in the sky. Multi-day search. We found, too, that uh, Yosemite mentioned that they spent almost $500,000 on the search for Michael. Yeah, that's just for him. That was just for him. So, like, when you talk about how much we said, like, they're using a quarter of yeah. the entire search budget, that means an eighth of the entire National Park Service search and rescue budget was spent trying yeah. to find this guy, which, again... How come there's not a news story about that? Right. Like, they spent an eighth of the budget for the year trying to find this guy, and there's no details. I know. Like, what? <laughs> like what's going on? I do plan to uh, mm -hmm. file a FIO request with the Park Service on Michael Allen in the coming weeks. So Yeah, they've got to have something. There's got to be a case file or we something. Just, we, we usually have like a two-week period where we're trying to reach out to people, and yeah. sometimes they'll respond to say, oh, I can't, and yep. those good reasons, that's fine. Like, we're not even hearing back, so yeah. hopefully hopefully we'll get something. So the, the search and rescue operation... They searched the area around the reservoir and the Pacific Crest Trail because they actually they actually found his backpack, which uh, now this is interesting. There's disputed reports of what was found inside his backpack. Um, <laughs> there's reports that the backpack contained a topographic map, a camera and a bottle of water. And the backpack itself was found near Tiltill Mountain. 
So we know there was a backpack found near Tiltill Mountain. So, so the undisputed part is backpack found. We know there's a backpack. We know it was near yeah. Tiltill Mountain, and it was at the base of Tiltill. So like off the trail, we don't know. Okay. There's no information on where the backpack was found. There's also they made a claim he deviated from the path. That's why it it had to have been off the path. I'm assuming because otherwise found it off the path. Otherwise, someone ran into him that knew he deviated. Yeah, and there's no report of that person, so they must have found it off the path. So normally we usually have more detail on the search and rescue operation, but we don't know how long it lasted. We don't know how many search and rescue individuals were involved. But we do know that no other items were found. His body hasn't been found. There's been no real no official... report of the pictures on the camera. Yeah, no like, official theories have been released that we could find on what they think happened to him. It's like we said, it's a very rugged area, and there's lots of animals, and it, it's highly trafficked. So there's a whole range of things that potentially could have happened <clears> to him. Just to get to back to like the the idea of this loop. The loop is basically a, a a circular trail that brings you back to where you started. Yep. And this loop goes just north of Tiltill Mountain. But what we said before when they said he's heading towards the PCT, there's like an extension on this thing where you can go arguably another six miles total yeah. to intersect with the PCT and come back. And up in that area, there's a lot more lakes. There's a lot more streams and rivers. So yep. thinking as a solo hiker who's got time, and I'm just I'm putting myself in in Fisheries shoes. That looks like from the map alone, it could be a really cool place. Yeah. If I'm ahead of schedule, I would go farther. I would go north more and check that stuff out. So that's where, you know, they said he talked about potentially going up to Lake Vernon. He talked about all these detours he might take. That, to me, is a guy who's going to take a detour if he knows he can get away with it. Yeah. And then there's also the the issue with, is there complacency because he's experienced? And I have, I have an issue with stating that he's experienced. I think there's two different levels of experience. Like Maybe experience meaning he hikes a lot? Experience meaning he, he's hiked a lot and experience in that he knows what he's doing. I think like he's survivor man experience yeah. or bear grills experience versus I go hiking. I go hiking a 50 lot. 50 times a year, yeah. but it's usually day hikes because um, <clears throat> a lot of comments I've read on different articles that we were able to find. People keep bringing up the fact that, you know, he had this itinerary when he went out and I know from a fact, and Joe knows this, when you get backcountry permits, you have to tell the rangers where you're going to be, you know, the entire time you're out in the park. So if you're going to campsite a, then I'm going to campsite D and then I'm going to be here because they and need you better to, be there. Yeah, because like, they they're, need... they're not going to scream at you, but like no, they're not going to get they, in trouble. They keep but... tabs big time. There's when we were in Glacier, that Canadian group like, yeah, skipped a campsite and, did, and then went to one they didn't have a permit for. Yep. And they were like tracking them down because we saw those two guys come by like, have you seen these people? Yeah, they're they're permit hopping. It's like, how do you, I'm like, I didn't even, I'm like, how do you even so know that? <laughs> the, the, the first red flag with Michael is he. He's changing his itinerary on the fly while he's hiking out in the backcountry, which is a big no-no. It doesn't uh, help search and rescue. It doesn't help search and rescue. They they think he's going to be in these spots at these times, and all of a sudden he just decides, well, I'm going to go to the Pacific Crest Trail instead of... In a very mountainous, very yeah. valley-ridden area and I don't know that's already I don't 25 know. miles long. Yeah, I don't know any experienced, I'm doing air quotes, experienced <laughs> hikers that... Uh, are going to, you know, have an itinerary set up on a multi-day backcountry trip that's, you know, 30, you know, 25 miles into the backcountry and just on a whim decide to change their plan. So that that is why I kind of have an issue with when people, you know, claim he was an experienced hiker. Yeah, cuz he did things that are more cocky than experience driven. It it to me it sounds like he may have not have been prepared for the hike. Uh he maybe didn't have the correct gear, the correct clothing. He obviously had a topographic map, but theoretically. We don't know for sure. It was disputed yeah. claims, but that would be a good thing to have, especially in a mountainous area like Yosemite where he was hiking. I, I think that's a, a, a claim that everyone says he experienced. I, I kind of question that on the very little information that we know. Well, and it's so it's, it's during the period of the year where it's not rainy. It's, yep. it's pretty warm. I'd be interested to know if it's like it started raining and got colder than necessary potentially yeah. then 
based on what he you know he was in like the ripped sleeveless shirts things like that it's i mean it, based on what he was wearing he, it sounds like it was pretty hot was, out the backpack was found with just those three things so let's let's dispute those things they three articles i don't know how that's disputed if you find a back with three things in it how can you get that wrong but like where's the food where's the tent you're gonna be out there for is he that much of like a naturalist type, like I'm gonna find my own shelter. He's gonna build his own shelter. Yeah, I don't need a coat. I don't that need is stuff. shocking to me that that that's all they allegedly found in his backpack. I, if you found my backpack out in the woods and I went missing, it would be forty pounds yeah, full I'm, of stuff. Yeah, I, I have cr- I have crap <laughs> that I wouldn't bring in my car. Yeah, but I'm carrying it, which is just dumb. So <laughs> that, like I said, that leads me to think that before we even get in a theory of what potentially happened to him, I think. This man was unprepared for the hike he was going on, unless he had a four-day permit and was only going out there for a day. He was just going. But his plan to make that big loop, like you said, is a 25-mile loop, which there's no way you can do that in a day. Yeah, Even that, if that's, that's, that's like Olympic-level running. Yeah. You know, there's, I'm sure there's people out there that can do it. His age, based on his build, based on the pictures we're looking at, yep. it's not like this guy was doing Boston marathons and winning them. Um, like <laughs> that, we don't know. He yeah, maybe that, did. maybe there's zero. There's not a lot of details. So I'm profiling him right now. Yeah, it's it's it. It seems like so. Okay, how about this? Is it possible he went that went out there to commit suicide? I mean, that's that's a possibility. I think. Um, like, is his whole like he was? I, I we don't know if he's depressed. And so he's normally gonna go, he's going to go end it in nature. Yeah. Normally we always, we all we'll always say, we'll we'll mention the family life for the person I'm missing because that's a really good sign of if did they have a good marriage? Did they have kids, a great job, you know, family and friends liked them. That's a good sign that they're probably not going to go out in the woods and commit suicide with uh, Michael. We don't know any of the family story. We don't know where he worked. We don't really know anything about his personal life. So well, if we can overanalyze what is somewhat... So you have this guy claiming to be his brother. Yeah. And the one thing he has to say about it is negative. Yeah, that's not... Like, uh, he he probably wasn't prepared. Yeah. So maybe he had no good, well, strong relationships. I think, uh, you know, one of the, the possible theories in my head looking at this is you've got... He, he planned his itinerary, so he's planning to do this loop. Which would not be... That wouldn't... That wouldn't make sense if you were trying to commit suicide. So, yeah. <laughs> like, hey, here's my whole well thought out plan of how I'm going to get home. So I'm I'm wondering if because it obviously shows that this guy decides to kind of change his itinerary on the fly. The search and rescue operation kind of searched around the reservoir and the Pacific Crest Trail. When you look at a map of Yosemite where he was at, there's a lot of different trails you could walk off on. He could coming up Tiltil Mountain. He could obviously go north towards. Pacific Crest Trail, then he could either go, he could either continue going north out of the park or he could go west and then it takes it south out of the park. He could have gone left over to the Jack Main Canyon Trail. Did they say how he got to the trailhead? Did not. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's so many, that's crazy. so many holes in the, the information that's publicly available. So he, obviously, which he, is shocking for it being so recent. Yeah. Like if this was like a 30s, 40s investigation, like, yeah, they just didn't know what the hell they were doing back then. There was more information on Bobby Bicep. I, yeah. Um, well, he was a kid, too. Yeah. So I think one of the theories potentially is that he was able to get outside of the search area and then something happened to him because there's a lot of different trails he could take. So he was just freelancing willy nilly. Like maybe he really is going quick. wherever his heart took him. And yeah, maybe he really is quick on the trail and he's able to cover a lot of miles a day. Yeah. And he decided to go a different way in the park and something happened to him somewhere else in the park. And they just, because it's such a big park, a they big got a park, search where and they this found is an area backpack. that's not heavily trafficked. Yeah. So I wonder, do you throw his backpack down? And take some stuff to go on like a quick overnight somewhere, maybe. Maybe, maybe. He, maybe he was better maybe. prepared. Like, cause a lot of those guys that, like, cause I know a lot of people that don't use tents. Yeah. But they'll have a tarp and hiking poles yep. and they'll do a lean to yeah. or they'll do some sort of makeshift shelter and have a backpack. So mm-hmm. did he, did it, I, I thought I saw, did they have a picture of his backpack? Did it look like a day pack or did I it look like a, a picture big, of it? So if if he had like a big pack, because I always take a day pack with me. Let's 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 assume that he's not suicidal and it wasn't an accident. He threw his bag down, 
and so had a either, day pack with either he other decided, supplies. Yeah, either he decided to go on a quick day hike. He's leaving his pack there. He'll be back at night for that. Or he left, he took his pack off, and he was just going to stay near that general area and something happened. Yeah, he'll come either. back the next day and get his bag or whatever. Or he fell down the side of a mountain. or he, There are lots of streams and creeks and rivers and lakes. There's always a possibility that maybe he decided to go for a swim and drowned yeah. or wash down one of these creeks. I know in our previous talks with the PIO from Joshua tree and even the search and rescue director, a lot of times water can move remains of people out of a search area or into a search area. Uh, so that's a possibility. Yeah. You'd think that if an animal attack would have happened, that would have been part of the, the story on, Michael I think, Allen. It, and we've said this before and I don't want to beat it, beat it to death, but you have, Evidence, of, evidence an of an attack happening and like things are spread out and yeah. Now, one interesting aspect is the Pacific Crest Trail is a, a national, you know, it's nationally known. It's kind of like the Appalachian Trail of the West and it goes from Canada to Mexico. There could be a criminal element element involved. There are stories along all along the, the trail of criminal activity happening, sexual assaults. Down near L.A., SWAT teams were produ- uh, pursuing. Oh yeah, there's that bank story. robbers. Yeah, there was, the there was a search and rescue team was held at gunpoint. They were held at gunpoint, PCT, so they had to get um, the SWAT team out there. So. Yeah, so there it is a highly trafficked trail. There's a potential that something happened. He got to the trail and uh, he got mixed up with the wrong group of people coming down the trail. That's a not you know possibility. Again, you would think maybe someone would have seen it, someone on yeah. the trail. So this is a this is a puzzling case, and it's it's puzzling also in the sense of the lack of information available. I I'm shocked that there isn't a news article on this. Yeah, anytime or, we get some of these old cases, you know, we're missing certain details, yeah. like little things that nowadays, like they don't they don't miss anything. They they record everything nowadays. So this like, is like having a puzzle and missing two thirds of the pieces. This is like missing like <laughs> ninety nine. Like you've like the border. Yeah, and then, and then that's it. Like yeah, we know he was here. And then he was gone. Yeah. That's the official thing. Yeah. Like, like <laughs> we found a backpack, we think, and we, I, we don't know what was in it. I, I know you had, you had a theory. I think for me personally, I think the most logical explanation is he, he hiked out of the search area and then something happened where he either injured himself to the point where he couldn't hike back or an animal attack or something else. And it was just, yeah, it could have been a bear. Could have been a bear. It Maybe just, he was off trail. And Yeah, and that terrain, if you're, yeah, I mean, I'd love to, I'd love to get, we, we reach out to a couple of the search and rescue people that do that area. I'd love to know their tactic yeah. when they know the itinerary because they're not going to, well, I'm sure they I'm sure they have a method to go why they have a sticking. window outside of it, but I'm yeah. sure they're going to stick to the trail because I you're supposed to be there. Looking at the map and <clears throat> knowing the search area, I think that's probably why they stuck. I'm kind of picturing a box that goes around Hetch Hetchy res- Reservoir up to the P- the PCT where he would have gotten on. Mm-hmm. There's a, there should be no way to search the rest of the park. Oh yeah, I mean, and and based on the dollar amount spent, it seems like they probably were pretty thorough. Pretty thorough, big team. I mean, you spend an eighth of the entire budget for search yeah. and rescue on one guy. Like they, they had some, they had some manpower out there, and they had machine power. And out there I, and I would go out on a limb and say, not only did he hike out of the search area f- for the, you know, the operate the rescue mission, but he must have gone off trail, like backcountry somewhere, because it's been what fourteen years now since he went missing. Yeah. No one's found a body or bones or anything. Yeah, I don't think it helps that that's a really low trafficked area too. Yeah, so we he, should do that loop when we go there. We we could do get that some loop. tourist spots and do that loop because it looks like it's a pretty neat one. It does actually. look pretty cool. It looks it looks really cool. And it's funny saying that because we're looking at a topographical map. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> like we're not looking at pictures. We're looking at a topo map and just kind of referencing our experience of when you have ups and downs and that much water like it's probably lush yeah it's probably like mountainous lush but it's not like can't breathe mountainous not mm-hmm. over 10 11 000 feet so it's um, probably a really beautiful area yeah uh, now do you have any any theories yourself or I, we covered kind of well i like the one for show reasons like you try and think of like the bombshell yeah. Like, and for me, it was like, oh, what if it was on purpose? But then there was too much planning involved. 
if you're going to do that, why bring a backpack? Like, and why have an itinerary? Why buy a permit? A lot of times, those people that go out in the woods to commit suicide, they'll leave some type of note in their backpack. Yeah, it's rarely just like... You, you always hear of like you the people are shocked that it happened. Yeah, it's like the people who actually do it don't talk about it. And I feel like, but it, like there is like a pattern still of people who still do it. Yeah, they days beforehand start like, here I own this property, I want to give it to you because I love you, or yeah. like to family members. I, I mean, I don't think you can rule suicide out. I think with the incredible lack of information on this guy, anything's possible. I think you can't rule anything out. Yeah. <laughs> I'm definitely going to get try and get the case file from the National Park Yeah, that would be, this one would be, I'd say of all the episodes, this one would be the best update. Just get detail on because I'm just thinking of so much that it could be. Yeah. And one more piece of small information. I know. Like, I feel like could at least like if we knew about rule his personal a couple life. things. Yeah. If we knew about his personal life, maybe we could rule some stuff out. Yeah. If we knew about his personal life, if we knew... If we had some eyewitness reports, maybe before he got into the park, so we absolutely knew he was at Hetch Hetchy. I mean, we know he was in that area because his backpack was found at Till Till Mountain. Yeah, and that's like the only thing that we can think of because to say he deviated from the plan to you me have no says, idea. yeah, to me, okay, but that of all the things they said, they weren't even sure the guy who made the statement was his brother. Yeah, but they seemed pretty confident he deviated from his plan. Yep, that had to have been where they found the backpack. And Otherwise, then there's somebody that talked to them yeah. that they didn't name and they found credible enough to to guarantee that, oh, this guy said it and here's why we believe him. I think exposure injury in this case is probably a very likely scenario, especially yeah, if he didn't have first aid kit or anything. It sounds like he I mean, to me personally, if gone on many hiking trips, it sounds like he was just completely unprepared to be out there for multiple days. I yeah. always carry a first aid kit radio sometimes when in my rule is again like you said everyone says experience experience is that just because people that know him know he hikes a lot that's what because i because i don't wear shorts when i hike ever yeah and it's not because i don't think they're good i have the breakaway ones for exposure purposes for safety purposes like pants are the way to go even in desert yeah like you think about oh i need to stay cool yeah if you're a tourist yeah but if you're hiking and you're trying to preserve water you don't want uv on you you want to stay cool moisture wicking will help yeah so anyone that goes in like like it seems like he probably like got out of a dead revival concert and then went for a <laughs> hike the way his description was he's dressed like torn off shoulder yeah torn bandana shorts probably had socks with sandals like, i'm gonna go hike in the mountains now yeah it's... so yeah maybe he hiked a lot but was stubborn yeah maybe that was what it is stubborn arrogant maybe uh, i don't want to speak ill of the currently missing no but, and but, but honestly, yeah i mean it's there's i've met a lot of people out there that and people you they have their trail name and they yep. obviously hike a lot they're just not dressed appropriately and it's more like oh we're tough yeah we hike so much we don't need that and honestly if anyone listening knows this family or maybe family members eventually listen to this we would love to talk to you and even interview, we would love to do an update show on this because there's a lot of interest interest in this missing persons case. If you just Google his name, everyone is it's kind all of talking interest. about the same thing. Yeah, because there's no there's no data, there's no info, there's no data and info. <clears throat> we would love to get information from the family or potentially anyone that worked on the search and rescue operation. <laughs> they, spent, they spent almost half a million dollars yeah. searching for this guy. No reports. This at is least, definitely at least a that case we found. I would like to come back and revisit. Yeah. Once we have more information, because like you said, it's we're filling in a puzzle with, you know, missing pieces here. I would say to say like final theory of the thing. I'm, I think I'm with you. Injury exposure. Yeah, I think I think injury exposure is the best injury exposure with a, 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 a dash of animal attack. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think I think he went out on this loop. He got near till till and he decided, you know what, I'm deviating from my original plan i'm gonna hike to who knows where he went but he he hiked somewhere else either he went up the uh, north or south on the pct or he took one of these other trails he eventually got outside of the area that he was hiking outside of the search area something happened he fell yeah he came succumbed to exposure i feel like i'll rule out criminal element because of where it is on yeah. the pct if you're on the pct at that point or even on this loop you're there for hiking, not for criminal activity. Yeah. Like so, when you when we talk about the guys that were, the SR that was held up, that's outside LA. Yeah, eighty-five miles the, outside yeah, LA. Yeah. Or there's portions of the PCT that go near towns. Yep. 
that where people are going to pray. Maybe they're looking for a solo hiker who's a woman to take advantage of. Yeah. That's going to be within a certain amount of miles of a town Yep. versus, you know, there's, there's creeps that hike as well. Yeah. But then the odds of running to running into a PCT through hiker yeah. in the middle of Yosemite yep. on a 70 mile stretch. That's not near any main town. Mm-hmm. I would say is rare. Yeah. I think, like I said, I think he, he hiked outside of the search area. He probably was off trail. He probably went off trail, injured himself, either fell, broke a leg or something, couldn't get out, succumbed to exposure. And no one's found him in 14 years because it's a big park. He was off trail. Now there's a good chance. Maybe down the road, someone will come across his remains or but, he's super experienced and he's living as a hermit out there. I mean, there's yeah. people that go out to disappear and live successfully. There's that one. Oh, that one. Was it New York? The guy lived in a cave for like 15 years. I remember that. I don't remember. It was the an, like an old man. And he yeah. like, they like finally found him one day and they're like, you owe taxes. Well, I know. I know when we were out hiking <laughs> in Hawaii, we on Kauai, we went into the Kalau Valley and we ran into people that lived in the jungle there. Oh, because there's free food and... Well, they're just like growing. It was like the Garden of Eden. You could eat food off trees. Yeah. There was like no spiders or snakes. And these people that were out there for years at a time, most of them from the That's, mainland. That sounds amazing. I know. When my kids get out of the house, I'm going to go live there. <laughs> What's the Wi-Fi like? It's like a podcast there's still. no Wi-Fi, <laughs> no, no cell joking. phone. <laughs> but then it'll be satellite. So um, those are our theories. Uh, yeah, I this one's... Uh, I'm with you. I think exposure injury yeah. with a potential animal or purposeful. I'm even shying away from from suicide. Maybe, like I said, if he's a big hippie, yeah, maybe he's out there living off the land somehow. Yeah, seems, I don't know. Seems like a bad spot to do it, but we need to know more about how his personal life was to kind of make a judgment on, you know, to fully rule suicide out. Yep. So you know, those are theories. I don't know, do you have anything else to add to this one or no, 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 <laughs> no, just please. Um, like I said, we, in the last few episodes, we're getting a lot more followers, a lot more listeners, a lot more people are interacting with us on the site. Yep. This one's open, man. Tell us what you think. Tell us what you think. If, if we get some sweet theories from listeners, we'll open up the next show and go over what everyone else thinks. If I, if I, if you guys have some earth rattling or earth shaking, if you're from the local area and you have a news report that you want to share, send it our way. Yeah, and we, we tell anyone if they're experienced in search and rescue or they're park rangers, we'd love to talk to you as well. Keep following us on Facebook. Uh, like us anywhere you're listening to the show. If you're on Apple, iTunes, or Stitcher, leave yep. us a, we a have, review. We have YouTube now. We're on YouTube now. Yeah, we got to bring that up. We got uh, YouTube going, and uh, we've been uh, Mike's been posting a lot of the National Park PSA videos, and yeah. we, we just started a... Two separate mini series uh, we're calling Get to Know Your Host, where we're just posting our personal videos of our hikes and stuff. And yeah, hiking with the hosts. We're going to post interesting videos from our years of backcountry hiking and scuba diving, in Joe's case. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the hiking of the sea. Yeah. That's what I call it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, just interact with us on all the different platforms we're on. And like I said, if you're on Apple iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play, leave us a review there that you know lets us know how we're doing. Stay tuned for some of the interesting contests we have coming up in our swag store. We uh, hope you enjoyed this episode, and we will talk to you soon. Yeah, thanks for tuning in. See you guys later.